um, rely on corridors into and out of Cambridge. But there doesn't seem to be anything in the centre of Cambridge that connects up to those corridors. And when are we going to get a decision where we have a scheme that um, covers the whole of the area rather than piecemeal projects? Thanks. We should declare Andy's interest as the person about stagecoach buses. Um, but uh, let's start off with Lewis to uh, try and answer that. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, as, as someone, Andy, that knows this city as good as anybody else in the audience in terms of understanding the uh, fragmentation and the limits, the, the corridors, um, and the routes that we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, coming in from the south, coming in from the west, coming in from the north, um, are essentially those routes where we've got a continuity from the uh, homes often at the end, including the connections that your buses provide, whether fast or, or stopping buses, um, and the edge of the city centre, I think, um, as, as we're coming on to with the study to look at, well, how do we get people through the city centre? Um, in, form, in the form of a carrot, um, we, we really need to look at uh, that last mile. Um, and so that's the basis of the study which will be reported to both the city deal and also to the combined authority in, in July. And obviously we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get your input into that. The, 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 the issue that we need to do more work on and which um, we have had a very good discussion between assembly members and board members on, is that we really need to lift our game also on, to some extent, what might be the stick or the demand management aspect. So we haven't finished that project and there's other questions on similar ground. So we do need to address the, the routes that we will actually uh, achieve, what Chris described earlier, of the 15 uh, percent reduction on the basis of current vehicles, car vehicles, particularly at the peaks. I think that the, the trick, and uh, we saw enough, to, we've seen enough congestion on several evenings um, in the last month. The trick is to come up with a targeted set of measures which actually um, make it more difficult um, for uh, people to be incented to travel at certain times. There's, there's three or four hours in the day where we, we have a real challenge. And we, we, we do need to come up with some options. Um, and I'll come on to it in answer to a later question, but, but we need to engage with people about well, how can we um, do that without limiting people's movements, not at peak hours. So um, in part, it's a joint activity and it, with the mayor. And it's also a discussion with yourself and the other bus operators because um, it is a partnership that relies on uh, people providing bus services and clearly Stagecoach does take an awful lot of cars off the road already by the quality and the frequency of its services. Can I ask John to comment on this? Sorry to pass the microphone to John. Um, yeah, I, I think that connecting up to the centre of the city and within the city sort of circumference is, is really important. You can't have uh, an effective transport system across the region haven't connected up to the hub. Um, but my own view is that the best way of doing that is to go underground. Um, because clearly there's a lot of historic and treasured building in the city and we don't want in any way to compromise that. And so the only option is to go underneath it. And if we could do that economically, then we can get to almost any part of the city with just a short transition at the end with some sort of short distance last mile of transport system. So I'm not going to ask every panel member to answer every question, but as we've mentioned the word underground, I feel like I should ask the mayor if he wants to answer the question. In the uh, uh, spirit of brevity, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next question then, uh, from Peter Lanzor. Do you remember your question? Apart from regressing housing transport, what must we do to improve quality of life now and in the future? So if I start with yes. Sorry, I, I, I haven't got the, I'm like Lewis, I haven't got the list in front of me here. 
So it's, um, apart from addressing housing and transport, okay. how can we protect the quality of life now and in the future? Yeah. Well, I think it's absolutely key, and, and we have to look at Cambridge uh, and why Cambridge is so successful internationally. Uh, and of course, it's, it's university, yes, it's, it's talent pool, yes, of course. Uh, but Cambridge is uh, more than anything, maybe to me, maybe not to you, uh, but it's a rural city. Uh, and it's, it's extraordinary beauty is enhanced by the fact that it's a rural city. And uh, we meddle with that at our, at our era. One of the reasons I'm so keen to go underground is because it doesn't mean that. Uh, and I think it's also obvious that uh, to build around and on the green belt of Cambridge would spoil the very nature of what makes Cambridge what it is. So, so effectively we have uh, a, uh, I'll use the word greater because it's, it's in both. Uh, but the, the, the Cambridge itself is simply 120,000 people, greater Cambridge is around 350,000 and that growth for Cambridge that will come, will come in the market towns and uh, the surrounding area, the new, new towns as well. Um, and that's why we need an integrated transport plan, uh, not just for South Camps and the city as we mentioned, but, uh, but across the south of the county and beyond into, uh, uh, into the surrounding areas uh, that we have. So how do you protect the quality of life in Cambridge? Well, you enhance the ability for people to travel in and out of the city and you protect its rural nature and the centre by making sure you go under the city. Mark, well, can I ask you for a business perspective? You can, thank you. Uh, well, I would just call on the matter of the court in terms of the rural nature and the rural belt. I think the reality is, and we heard this council a bit earlier around the skills, the skills proposition of upskilling the existing workforce to maintain uh, that supply here and avoid some of those trips uh, and some of that demand uh, that might come on the system. I think in terms of transport, it, you know, it is a, a significant part of the solution in maintaining uh, that identity and remembering Cambridge to be such a special and unique place. And I think you know, clean air and things like that need to play a significant role in our thinking. I think some of the green agenda has not quite captured our thinking to date, and that would support some of the other things that are being said on this planet. Thank you. Noel, anything to add? Um, I suppose I would say, how can we uh, protect the quality of life, of life? And that's by <coughs> being brave, ambitious, and maybe I would say this, but embracing technology. I think, you know, Cambridgeshire County Council was set up in digital connectivity infrastructure programme, connecting Cambridgeshire sort of back in 2011, slightly, slightly ahead of the curve. I think there's an opportunity to really continue that, you know, to, to understand how technology underpins everything we do. And it's not to say that technology is the solution, but it actually helps us more that. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, the chair of the uh, Cambridge branch of the FSD, Federation of Small Businesses, and it's about... Um, we've heard a lot about partnership working. There's a lot of stakeholders with different views, etc., and, and priorities. Um, really, it's a question about how the small views of the small, and, and priorities of the small business is going to be um, taken into account. Um, we had the the road closure um, uh, proposal, which uh, would have affected a lo number of our uh, members in the centre of Cambridge. So. It's about uh, how, how you're going to consult the small business community. I'd like to start off with Mark. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think given the example that you've uh, uh, made there, obviously that went to a consultation with the Enterprise Partnership Lab, uh, in partnership with the then City Deal, and obviously that didn't happen. So I think it is our responsibility to work together, and you'll be well aware from your experience with the Enterprise Partnership that we have a pretty good business representative organisation group uh, who only actually met three days ago uh, to consider the wider aspects of how those voices are heard across the whole wide economic geography, including the aspects of the Greater Cambridge Partnership, which uh, you know, we will continue to do. Uh, Lewis, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of as I mentioned, there's been quite a bit more thinking done by the assembly and the board, and uh, the board discussed it only in the last week, but we're planning a couple of engagement events in September, 
and clearly there are specifics for business, but there's also issues for the people who live in the city and who live here. So I think we've got a number of threads which we need to look back again at about well, why are people driving in at the peak. That would be informed by the assessment of all of the number plate work that's been undertaken, so there'll be feedback on that. There are definitely, there's definitely a challenge of business to be viable, but and also have vital and important city centre businesses who need to get goods in and out. And some of that means that they need to be able to get their vehicles in and out. But I think some of it is also about looking at last mile delivery. I think we need to look afresh, particularly the large numbers of random vans that come into the city um, who don't just uh, raise issues of just volume of vehicles, but they also raise some fairly odd driver behaviour and just blocking our roads, blocking our buses, and making life difficult. So I think we, we certainly on the business side, I think we, we do have to have a dialogue about freedom for those businesses are already here, but, but a different route for some of the deliveries. And we're still committed to aspects like clean air. So I think we've got a package of measures working with the County Council on parking, um, parking ride, um, residential parking, but allowing people to come in. Um, and we are a vibrant, vital city, and we've got a range of issues, and I think we just have to continue that dialogue in September. Thank you. Can I ask you a second question? You, okay, right. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of, uh, we've got the Greater Cambridge Partnership, we've got the LEP, we've got um, the, um, we've got the uh, Combined Authority as well, with the same, really, objectives. And it's about working together and making sure that, you know, we're all pulling in the, you're all pulling in the same direction and not, and we, the, the money is not swallowed up in bureaucracy, etc. between the three bodies. So, so I think uh, I was keen to know how we're going to avoid that, really. Um, yeah. So if we could start with you, James. Yeah, well, I think it's a very good question. It's something we've got in mind for long, clearly. Uh, Lewis, uh, on my left here, is always on my left, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually have got some fairly shared ideas. We've got, we've, we've, we've got many, many, many more shared ideas and opinions than, than we don't have. So, uh, but Lewis is a member of my cabinet, of course. He's also the chairman of the City Deal. Clearly, we work together on a regular basis. It's very important we don't uh, have duplication. Mark and I were talking earlier about how we make sure as as time goes on, that we continue to work far more closely together. Uh, it was since night, an, an excellent uh, uh, presentation on apprenticeships, which are key to what I want to achieve across the whole of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Clearly, it would be ridiculous for me to set up a scheme that didn't include what the city do in, deal are doing, and clearly, the LET are already working in that area. We need to make sure that we're working together. Uh, if you know anything of my background, you know that uh, bureaucracy is not something I look fondly on. Uh, and being government is something that I'm very, very keen on. So you won't see a very large combined authority staff-wise. We're very conscious of that. Uh, and we will always try to work with our partners, uh, who we already have a good working relationship with, to make sure the problems that you suggest do not happen. Thank you. Yes. I mean, the three organisations do have specific jobs. And so we can get on and do those, like the government has is only at the moment saying that the city deals are going to run the city deal 500 million. But we clearly you know, we, we can integrate better. Um, we don't need three people, as, as uh, James has said, leaving on skills. We need to resolve that. Um, similarly, in terms of geography, Greater Cambridge has got its plan for the next five, seven years. But I think what we're envisaging, and that's why I've taken on the role working for James and the combined authority on a broader spatial plan right across the Cambridge of geography, is I think we can expect that in the next phase we will be looking much harder at some longer distance travel. Um, we will look at housing in, in the market towns and in, in much better connected locations. So I think we're going to see a slight uh, thinking ahead on that geography on a bigger area. But we, we will work together, we will uh, be lean, and we do need to integrate what we're doing. Can we just hear from Mark as the third of the department? 
Yeah, yeah thank you. It was to go against that now, isn't it, really? But I, I think the reality is the enterprise partnership is we represent the widest economic geography. And we are a private sector led partnership, partnered with our colleagues here, of course, and partnered with universities. Uh, and we see very much the same picture as has just been described about working together. There is a need to work that out and how that might work best for the business community and how we might do that together better. So I think, yep, we're, we're happy to undertake that. But I think you know, I've spoken to James and Lewis about the wider geography. The reality is the combined authority area is only 50% of the left geography. Uh, and we all know that skills come into this place from West Suffolk, from West Suffolk and other places that are outside of the combined authority area. But again, I mean, we're with James and the wider economic geography around the left then we understand that we're going to have to work on that together as well. So I think we're, the good news is we're all in the same room and in the same places in terms of our thinking, but we will need to evolve how it's done and how it works together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, the question I've put as well is um, how do we justify um, even considering schemes with a very low benefit uh, cost ratio? Um, uh, and, and, and sort of uh, there's, there's guidance on this. Um, uh, how, how do we explain um, going outside the guidance uh, to taking these schemes further? I mean, this sort of, it really sort of um, opened up the, the, the political question of how do we convince residents, or we, how do we reassure residents that schemes um, which bring large change, often destruction, um, uh, will bring benefits and um, that way that, um, uh, especially if you're talking about some of these very, very expensive schemes now, um, like undergrounds, but they're um, uh, going to be uh, have probably uh, on the face of it low like cost benefit ratios, then um, how do we convince people that they are worthwhile and are valued for money? No, it's a technical question, but do you want to just give a brief overview from an officer perspective? Well, I can give an officer perspective from the smart um, from the smart work stream, not, not specifically from transport schemes in terms of the way those work, but, but one thing I can say, and I referenced this earlier, that it's been a very strong collaborative effort with a lot of partnership work. And so, for example, um, I mentioned the uh, Intelligent City platform. We've had an, an enormous amount of support from the local tech community, but also the universities. And you know, a, a kind of rough calculation has shown us that, that actually, for, for every bit of input from the City Deal Partnership, there's been equal from, from the universities or from private companies. And what that has achieved is actually uh, minimising the cost of the public purse, but maximising the value. So I think, um, I can't speak for other work streams, but certainly I can say there that, that in fact, the, you know, the, the cost against value has been, you know, the, the value has far exceeded the cost. But he's not on the panel, but I'm just going to bring Chris in on this, because it does feel like it needs that bit of technical uh, expertise from a transport point of view, if that's what we're going to do. Oh, good God. Um, right. Yes, it is a problem. This is national policy. It's through what the Department of Transport, Transport call WebTab. They look for a cost-benefit ratio of about 1.5 to 2. In other words, you invest a pound, you get two pounds back, and you get one pound fifty back. However, it's got to be taken in the wider round. And you can get cost-benefit ratios that are much less than that. You've got to make the case, but the strategic business case covers far more than just the investment and the benefits that you get back. And just as an example for that, when they built the Jubilee Line in London, it's one rule for one and one rule for everybody else, the Jubilee Line extension in London had a cost-benefit ratio of less than one. It was done for investment. It opened up investment areas. So they accepted it on that basis. So whilst normally you would look at those high cost benefit ratios, you can actually make the case for lower cost benefit ratios and you can make that case quite well. In terms of um, the decisions that are still to come to the city deal in this month's meetings, but also the assembly of the board and then in September onwards, the there's a full range of options. So, I mean, in terms of assessing and, and you know, some sort of uh, challenges, if we're looking at the, the sort of south down through towards the places where there are large numbers of jobs and where there may be uh, housing linked to Haven Hill housing, there's a proposal from Uttles for, for the Chesterford side. The, the, the obligation is for us to, first of all, come up with proposals that link homes, jobs, and existing communities. And in that process, um, as is shown in how we're looking at Milton Road and also in comparing on road, off road, um, along the A4 to A, <coughs> um, we will be looking also at getting the best 
outputs in other ways? What's the best environmental output? What is the view of the community? How does it leave the environment and um, uh, the quality of life in different parts? Uh, so I think we, we're not all looking at the PCR, we're looking at how to get the best from the funding we've got to link homes, jobs and uh, do that in a way that uh, keeps the quality of life. They're, they're, nothing's for free. Sometimes we have to make choices and uh, some of that then links into the discussion about well, what is the best route? Is, is, are we going to go faster buses in the future or are we going to go light rail? How is it deliverable? What is fundable? So, I think we, we are going to make wise decisions and get the very best out of the money. And we should be investing in cycling. The, the near 20 million will make the road shift. And some of the schemes, including some of the complicated and difficult choices we might have in the future about the city centre, they do not involve directly highest costs, but they do involve some challenging choices. And some of the changes are going to be about um, that choice by the community. How do we change the way we behave and reduce the number of cars? And some of that does not require millions and millions of pounds. Thanks. I'm going to move on to the next question, just to keep things moving. So, uh, Will Nichols um, has got a question. Thank you, very, thank you very much. I'm, I'm asking this question on behalf of Jane Passon Todd, who's the Chief Executive of Cambridge Ahead. Uh, she asked, uh, it, she recognises it's important to find long term solutions to East congestion in the city but wanted to know how cost-effective tunnelling versus land-based options were um, given Cambridge's relative small size and the fact that the only other cities that I'm aware of that have underground metro systems are London, Glasgow, Liverpool and Newcastle. Start with John. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's a very uh, fundamental question. And at first sight, tunnelling is always more expensive than going on the surface, so one has to start at that position. So if you had a plain field, and you were wanting to put a transport pathway across it, to go on the surface would have to be cheaper than London. That equation does change, though, under certain circumstances. Uh, and there are two things that change it. The first is the cost of going over the top, and the second is the cost of going underground. So if when you come to a, a city scenario, uh, particularly a, a very uh, constrained city like Cambridge, then if you want to put a transport corridor through the built environment at that point, it becomes very expensive not only in terms of money, but also in terms of time and planning permissions and then the, the angst about demolishing buildings and closing roads. When you add all of those things up, it comes to a much higher cost than just putting a surface pathway across the fields that we talked about a few moments ago. If you look underground, again, always expensive to go underground, but the cost of the tunnels is, is proportional to the size of the tunnels, or the area of the tunnels, I mean, basically the volume of earth you dig out. So if you can reduce the size of the tunnel, then you disproportionately reduce the cost. So if you halve the size of the tunnel, then you're pushing the cost down to about the quarter. So if you can deliberately keep the tunnels very small, and if on the top you've got a very congested urban space, then those two things both work to reverse the equation. So you, you can actually go underground at a price that is competitive, with it, even perhaps cheaper than going across the top when you account for things like planning permissions and the disrupt disruption that goes on with the surface board. James or Lewis, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I really like sitting next to this person. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm thinking of him a job, he's absolutely yeah, um, Clearly, Cambridge isn't a big city, and that's the one question that people ask about tunneling. Can it be afforded? Cambridge isn't very big, nowhere else is uh, 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 the size of Cambridge has tunnels. Um, but ultimately, because Cambridge isn't very big, the amount of tunnels you need under the centre of Cambridge isn't very, isn't very long. Uh, that's uh, not the best English I apologise. But uh, the suggestions I see are for around five kilometres of, of tunnels. And then, of course, it's the growth, as I mentioned, beyond Cambridge uh, and uh, control of that growth that, uh, that the, the people, who, you know, the investors who will want to invest in this scheme will want to, uh, want to know where they can get their money back because they're not going to get it back from the tunnels themselves. Uh, but it's the, the, the ability those tunnels give you to get across the city that, uh, that allows for the growth along, along the route. So um, it's not a new model. What we're suggesting isn't something that hasn't been achieved before. Um, London Underground was built by private investment, uh, and where they put a, a station, uh, the developers, uh, the, 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 the investors developed the, the houses and they paid for the, the underground. It's worked quite well. 
um, I don't think any of us could imagine uh, London without an underground. And we're not building an underground system for Cambridge and the Cambridge development and growth ends in five years' time. You know, what we've got here is an incredible driver for not just the, the economy here, but for the UK economy. And the government have to listen to what we've got to say because post-Brexit it's even more important than it was uh, uh, before, to say, before June the 23rd last year. So it's, it's about looking for a transport solution for Cambridge that's going to last, I think you said earlier, not just five or ten years, but 50 to 100 years plus into the future. Well, I, I mean, I'm not professed to be an expert on tunnels, but I mean, we, we know some in this city. The, at the core of it is to think, well, how do we get people through this one mile each side of the city centre? And then how does that lend to the transport systems there on? So the terms of reference for the study will be neutral, and then we'll look at those two, uh, that two double stages of, of, of transport. Um, but ultimately, it's the then that how does that study then link to the deliverability of such a project? And the test of that will be um, what is uh, not just the capital cost, but what is the actual um, projected usage um, and uh, ridership. So the number work will be there, and then who's going to fund it? Is it going to be private funded, or, or how else is it going to be funded? So I think we do the study, and we get the analysis. Um, and then we take it from there, working with the mayor. Thank you. Okay, so an ultimate question from Councillor Kenneth My question is largely um, aimed at the mayor, it's that given that um, you have the powers um, for bus franchising, will you be implementing those powers? If not, why not? And what do the other members of the panel think? So Thank you. Well, first of all, it's good to see you again, Kevin. And uh, just, uh, just a little in joke between Kevin. I don't think Lacazette is the answer uh, to the question that you've got over at Arsenal. So uh, uh, Kevin and I have different political views, and also he's Arsenal and I'm Spurs. So it's very little that uh, we have in common. But despite that, I think we've got a really good relationship. Um, well, he's got a, he's got a manager whose daughter's just uh, graduated yeah, from Texas yeah, yeah. as well. He's more intelligent than father. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't come to hear me argue football with uh, with, uh, with Kevin. Um, with deference to uh, uh, the, the gentleman who's sitting directly in front of you, um, my understanding of bus networks is limited, uh, and uh, and how to run them uh, even more so. And I wouldn't pretend that I have the answers to the issues uh, that we have in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Uh, but I need to understand. So I've already discussed uh, with, with Francis Berkeley uh, over email, and, and uh, I will, will we discuss this with Lewis as well. I think that, that we need to, I, need, I need a survey of bus services in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. I've had a lot of uh, contact from the public. People want to be able to commute on buses. They can't get on them early enough. Uh, what is the system we're using, what, what, what is my view, uh, and uh, I think an independent survey, an independent review of the, of the, the system. Um, I know that there are parts of the world that are, have, have massive expertise in or, for example, their buses work really well and are the preferred method of transport, uh, and I think that we can look at new ways. Is Drummer Street the right place to have the hub? Are there other, other ways we can look at what the situation is? Of course, and this goes back to the partnership working that we were speaking on earlier, I uh, was speaking about earlier, and, uh, and clearly it's going to be in conjunction with the city deal that we look at this. But I think it's very important that, uh, bear in mind the major transport changes that are coming to, to this part of the world, and the, 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 the desire and ambition that we have, that the bus SIS service and the bus system links into what we're trying to do in the future, and also uh, serves what the people need now. You know, I have to ask the question, it, would it be better to have more buses between 5 and 9 in the morning and less between 9 and uh, 4? I don't know the answer because somebody else would more intelligent probably does, which is why we'll get them to look at it. So, um, so, so the answer to your question in short uh, is yes. we're looking at it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly, yes. then, Lewis. Yeah. Well, the power is with the combined authority. I mean, we. Um, we should pay tribute to Stagecoach and to Tower for the investment that they put into buses uh, in the city. I think uh, 
the, the, the audience may not fully represent it, but I know there's a number of South Cambridge councils here. The critical issue is how we actually get the buses out, um, um, how we have fast buses along the main routes, and also we get buses out into into the villages. Um, I think what we also need to look at is infrastructure like travel bus. I know my colleague Francis Burke is really keen on, um, but I know that, yeah. We, we, we need to look at all the options and I think it's, there should be a far better dialogue between us and the bus operators and I know that this situation in Peterborough is very similar. Noel, can you just add something around the supporting infrastructure to help buses work most effectively? Oh, I, I suppose I think the point that we haven't necessarily heard today is that actually as we move forward what we need for people is public transport services around their needs, not around operators' needs or anyone else's. Um, so I think... Um, that's definitely the opportunity. Yeah, you might not have the power to do the franchising, but we would support you. <laughs> I certainly do. Okay, so I'm just going to use um, my prerogative as the chair of this panel to ask you a final question then. So, if the Greater Cambridge Partnership is successful, I just wonder if each panel member could quickly tell us what you think um, Greater Cambridge will look like in 2030 and beyond. So, start, start with um, Mark. We'll work along. That's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the reality is that we now recognise and know that this is a global place, and in the post-Brexit world, as been said, it has a role to play in the KPLC. So we mustn't underestimate that. But I suppose it's it's, it's best to go back to the Great Games Partnership's uh, approach to this, which is about yes, we want to grow this place and share the prosperity of it uh, within the wider geography whilst improving or maintaining the quality of life. Uh, and therefore, to do that, we've talked about many things that can be done. So some of those must be implemented now and in the future to, to, to make that better. Noel. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep this quite short. I think success would be that this area, uh, that Cambridge City particularly, is, continues to be a dynamic, uh, inclusive, connected place um, that as world-class public transport and, and leading-edge technology solutions supporting it. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to continue that theme and expand on it a bit, really, because it's strange that a city with only 120,000 people or so is a name that's known all over the world. You have to ask yourself, you know, how can such a small city be so well-known all over the world? And, and the answer is because, simply, over the years, some of the world's best people have been in this city, and to maintain that tradition in the next generation and generations beyond, we have to keep attracting the best people from wherever they are in the world. So that means today Cambridge has to be a great place to live. It has to be a place that attracts the best in the world, quite simply. And I'd like to see that continue to be the case. So that's my vision. Uh, well, I would expect Cambridge to be a rural city with a world-class university, a uh, world-class integrated transport system. Uh, uh, super fast fibre connected broadband uh, at the highest possible level and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the ability for people from outside the city to utilise the uh, incredible nightlife and uh, business functions that the city has. So it's, uh, it's offering something to people who are in the city and who are outside. Um, well, I think we, we certainly have to come forward with a far stronger plan to follow up the important elements of the local plan that we want to get adopted. Uh, and that has to get us to a place that is very different to Silicon Valley USA, where people have to travel 80 miles, um, often if they can't afford housing in that, in that zone. So we need to have affordable housing and significant new communities within 15 miles of Cambridge. We need to then network out through rail and other um, means to a wider uh, group of uh, places which will grow jobs but particularly be um, growth areas for housing. Um, we just need to end up being a balanced community so that everybody who works here can live here. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of the panel uh, and the questioners for um, enriching the debate that we've had uh, this evening. Um, I think it, it does sum it up really well. We have just such a fantastic opportunity here. There, there is no other place, as John said, uh, as, as Cambridge and Greater Cambridge, uh, the opportunity that we have. It's so, it's so much more than just being about transport, and sometimes the conversation gets dominated about that, but it is about the connectivity 
what makes this place special is the fact that there is such an amount of innovation and the research work and all, all of that is about collaboration and being able to bring those people together and, and maintaining that connectivity underpins everything that we're about uh, and all the other things that we've covered around housing and skills. So, you know, this is a place that's delivering life-changing products, discoveries and services and it's incumbent on all of us in the room to make sure that that continues. So we look forward to working with you on the plans that you've heard about this evening uh, and we just want to leave you with the video that fronts up our new website uh, launched today, is the promo, uh, and then we'll break for some more conversation and networking over some sandwiches. So thank you very much. Cambridge, our home and place of work, is one of the UK's most successful and fastest growing cities. A place of discovery, of learning and of life-changing research. A place which, for hundreds of years, has been a hub of the world's leading minds and now lies at the forefront of technology and economic growth. A place where education, business and finance work in synergy to be at the forefront of bioscience advancement, where people and business can thrive and prosper. Cambridge is a beautiful compact city, steeped in history and architectural glory. A place with famed green spaces, nestled within the stunning rivers, countryside and picturesque villages of South Cambridgeshire. A place widely known for cycling, with some of the highest rates in the country for people who regularly travel by bicycle. A place where sport and leisure thrive alongside a rapidly growing economy. Today, Greater Cambridge maintains proximity to London and international transport hubs in the east, making it a key part of the flourishing Cambridge Milton Keynes Oxford Growth Corridor. But the impact of our success is evident on our roads, on our streets, in the air we breathe. To keep Greater Cambridge growing and to secure our competitiveness in a Brexit economy, we must build a Greater Cambridge that is well networked for people and business with strong and healthy communities who are in easy reach of jobs, study and all the opportunities a successful city economy brings. The Greater Cambridge Partnership is a local academic business council enterprise charged with delivering the city deal for Greater Cambridge, working closely with local businesses, our communities, our mayor and with strategic partners to develop a better transport network, to speed up housing construction and provide our local economy with the skills it needs to grow. With up to £500 million in government funding to 2030 and millions more generated through local and private investment, we are in a unique position to create lasting change, to support sustainable economic growth, which will make a difference to people and their quality of life. We will create better and greener transport networks, connecting you to your homes, jobs, study and opportunity building upon our reputation for sustainable and active travel options. We will ensure homes are provided more quickly to meet the diverse needs of our growing communities, putting people within easy reach of employment, schools and other key services and to the wider transport network. We will supply business with the skills it needs to thrive by inspiring and developing people we will draw on our innovative environment to invest and develop smart technology that will help make our city more efficient and improve our day-to-day -day lives. The future is bright for Greater Cambridge. Now is the time for us to work together to keep it that way. Help us grow and share prosperity now, for all and for future generations. The Greater Cambridge Partnership, delivering your city deal.